Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Escondido OPC as we gather together to worship our Lord this Lord's Day. Uh, welcome to our guests and visitors. We are glad to have you worship with us this morning. Uh, if you don't have a bulletin, there are bulletins uh, in the back. This will uh, help you to follow along with the service, the scriptures that are preached from and read from, and then as well as the songs that we sing. And underneath your pew is a red uh, Trinity Psalter hymnal. This is what we'll be singing from. Uh, so you can follow along with us in that. So again, glad to have you worship with us this morning. Welcome. Uh, just a few announcements before we begin. Uh, today we will be having our uh, fellowship meal. Uh, you are welcome to join us. Uh, it's kind of potluck style, um, so there's going to be plenty of food, and we'll be meeting in the back, uh, back room back here across the way. Um, that will be after service. Um, we are beginning our summer uh, sermon discussion where, uh, so nor our normal catechism has ended, but now we'll be having, everybody will be invited back in here, uh, and it's an opportunity to ask questions about uh, any of the sermon discussions uh, or sermon topics that were preached from. And uh, Neva will continue to preach the little ones, uh, preach, Neva will continue to teach uh, the little ones. Um, and uh, I also want to put on your radar the Boz, this is the Boz last Sunday, and they were gonna be, they will be traveling Tuesday or Wednesday uh, so please be keeping them in prayers uh, as they travel. Uh, we go, go with our blessing, uh, so please keep them in, in your prayers. And then this evening, uh, no evening service. Uh, normally we have evening service, but this is the fifth Sunday, so we have no evening service this evening. So now, let us prepare our hearts as we worship our Lord. Please stand for the call to worship. This morning from Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are our God, and we will give thanks to you. You are our God, and we will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the great God and King of heaven and earth, and there is no other gods beside you. You are the one and only, sovereign, eternal, from everlasting to everlasting. We thank you, O oh Lord, in your good and perfect plan. You created this beautiful world. And then when it fell into sin, you ordained a perfect plan of redemption focused upon our great high priest, Jesus Christ, your son, who was born of a woman and under the law to fulfill all the law for us so that we might be redeemed from sin and death and made your people. We thank you that in Christ you have shown us that your steadfast love endures forever and your faithfulness is never ending. So, Lord, in the merit and by the love and grace of Jesus Christ, we come now as your children. We come as those who were once enemies but have made, been made your friends and your servants. And we come to sing forth your praise. We come to join the angels in heaven and to lift up our voices to sing Hosanna to you in the highest, to praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So consecrate us unto yourself this morning hour so that we might worship and praise and adore you now and forever. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Our blessed and holy Father brings us into his presence and reveals his holiness to us through his law. 
this morning summarized for us from Romans chapter 13, a summary of our Lord's law. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, <coughs> you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbors yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Truly our Lord's word is perfect. His law is a light into our path to show us how we are to live and please him. And it also shows us our sin, our weakness, and how we once again need his mercy and forgiveness. Let's, let us bow our heads and confess our sins together, first in a moment of silence, confessing our own sins, and then together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are high and holy, that though you dwell in an approachable light, nevertheless you are merciful. You are tender and heavenly Father, and in Christ you call us and you give us the sure promise that when we humble ourselves and confess and repent, you are faithful and just to forgive us. So Lord, this morning hour we do come before you and we humble ourselves. And we confess that we've sinned against you. In thought, word, and deed, Lord, we are guilty. Our sins have piled up from another week. And we pray, O oh Lord, that once again, as we confess these sins, as we cast them at your feet, you will wash us and cleanse us from them. We confess that we've sinned against you. In thought, word, and deed, indeed, all our sins are against you. So often our love for you is replaced with hatred and bitterness and anger. Instead of being grateful and thankful in our hearts towards you, so often we complain. We're quick to judge. We are quick to file complaints and shake our fists against you. As well as, O oh Lord, not only is our love for you often wandered and fallen short, but our love for our neighbor has also been wrecked with sin. And so, Lord, we confess that we have not been kind and compassionate and patient with one another. Too often we are impatient. We lash out with rude, uh, rude cruelty and quick judgments, unfair judgments. We show partiality. We show prejudice to one another. And so often we put ourselves first in all things instead of serving one another before ourselves. Our charity has been cold and stingy instead of being self-sacrificial and generous, giving even when it hurts. We are not a people often that keep our word. We make promises, we make commitments, and we fail to keep them. Instead of keeping our promises, we renege, we fall short, and we, O oh Lord, sin in our promises and words. And so all these sins and many more, we know our sins are manifold. We confess them and we lay them at your feet and we pray, O Lord, see us in Christ. Look upon us through the merit of Jesus Christ and may his perfect work on our behalf cover us with his grace once again and may you show us the mercy to forgive us so that we might know we are forgiven, and the freedom and the lightness of the gospel to be children of heaven, all of grace. And then, O oh Lord, with this sweet grace of forgiveness, may we be those who overflow with love and gratitude. May we flourish 
in our obedience and good works. And may our wisdom increase by your mercy so that we might glorify you more and more in all we think, say, and do. So hear us this morning hour as we confess our sins, forgive us in Christ, and then by your grace may we be those who walk in new obedience. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear now the reading of the gospel this morning from Hebrews chapter 10. But when Christ has suffered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Beloved saints of the Lord, rejoice this day that having confessed your sins in faith, you can know and be at peace that your sins are forgiven, all because of Jesus' one sacrifice on the cross in history 2,000 years ago. This is your confidence, your surety, and your joy that Christ died for you, and you belong to him, and nothing can separate you from his love. This is the gospel proclaimed to you this Lord's Day. Let us now stand and sing in response hymn 333. Let us stand and sing. Men, you may be seated. So we turn in the Old Testament to Genesis 49, reading just a section of that chapter, verses 8 through 12. Genesis 49, an ancient blessing of Jacob to his sons, focusing on the blessing to Judah. Genesis 49 beginning in verse 8 through verse 12. God's holy and inspired word, give your attention to the reading of it. Genesis 49, beginning verse 8. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's club. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? 
scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his, coal, his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to, it, to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. As far as the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Let us now stand and sing a portion of Psalm 118. Psalm 118b, but just singing verses 5 through 8. So 118b, verses 5 through 8. Let us stand and sing. Please remain standing for the reading of the New Testament, Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. God's word from, from the New Testament, give your attention to the reading of it, Mark 11, the first 11 verses, God's word. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to him, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told him what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. As for the reading of God's word, may bless it to us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice that you are so generous and tender and patient with us. For, Lord, we know we are stubborn. We are slow 
And we so often put up walls to resist you and your truth. And yet you patiently and compassionately continue to minister to us by your word. And so we pray this morning hour that your Holy Spirit would lower the walls that we rise up, that it would remove the pride and arrogance from our hearts, that it would consecrate all the distractions of everyday life about the weak unto you, and you pray that you would give us attentive minds and true ears to hear and eyes to see by faith your truth. And then may, by your truth, may we be sanctified. May we be conformed to the image of Christ so that we go forth walking in his wisdom and his love for your glory. Be also with the preaching of your word. May it be done for the strengthening of your dear saints and particularly for the glorifying of your most holy name. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So if you have a dog, what do you do for training? Well, as you know, there's a big difference between a trained and an untrained dog. First, there's house training, which hopefully every dog gets. But then you can train to the leash in obedience or to fetch a ball. Next, there's advanced training where dogs can do some amazing things. They can herd sheep merely at the command of whistles. Police dogs can catch criminals and sniff out drugs. Seeing eye dogs safely lead their owners around. And some dogs can even smell out cancers and other diseases for doctors. Pretty impressive. On the other hand, there is an untrained dog, which is basically a cat, as they just <laughs> lay around and expect to be petted all day. And so it is with other animals. Just because it's domesticated doesn't mean it's well-trained, and an untrained animal can be both useless and even dangerous. Thus, our Lord does the seemingly impossible as he uses an unbroken donkey to publish the most profound truths about himself as our Savior and King. So the moment that we have been waiting for is here. Jesus has made it to Jerusalem. As you know, the holy city lies at the heart of just about everything in the Old Testament. Nearly all of the Lord's grand promises center and orbit around Jerusalem. For literally a thousand years, the nucleus of the Hebrews' faith has laid in Zion, the city of our God. If the Messiah is to do his job, he must labor in Jerusalem. Yet for Mark, this is the first time Jesus has ever made it to Jerusalem. Now, sure, in real life, Jesus has been there many times, but in terms of Mark's presentation of our Lord's official ministry, he's never been here. It's almost as if Jesus has been trying to avoid Jerusalem. This means there's an extra helping of suspense and excitement upon his arrival. This is a big moment. Thus, Mark takes some time to set up the scene, which he does first by mapping out the geography. As Jesus is hiking up the road, he first came to the unwalled village of Bethany. Now, Bethany was just shy of three kilometers from Jerusalem, as it sat on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. Its name means house of affliction or humility, but this hamlet makes no appearance in the Old Testament. Next, the road passes over the Mount of Olives and descends down the western side to run into Bethphage, which is another small village only about one kilometer from Jerusalem. Now, like Bethany, Beth Fage does not grace the pages of the Old Testament, and its name means the house of unripe figs. So by these two villages, Mark gives us a picturesque image of Jesus' movement. But there's now another geographical designation, the Mount of Olives. 
And unlike the towns, the Mount of Olives does show up in the Old Testament, but only a few times and in very significant places. The first key occurrence of the Mount of Olives is in Ezekiel 11. There, the prophet witnessed the glory of Yahweh exit the temple. The glory then traveled to the eastern gate of the city and departed Jerusalem to stop and sit on the Mount of Olives. As God forsook and abandoned the temple and the city in judgment, his glory exited via the Mount of Olives. Therefore, after exile, the prophet Zechariah foretold the return of God and his glory to Jerusalem. And in chapter 14, the glory made its return by coming to stand on the Mount of Olives. Yahweh's glory departed by the Mount of Olives, and he would return via the Mount of Olives. And yet, we have no historical recording of Zechariah 14 ever being fulfilled. Post-exile, the glory never returned to Jerusalem or the temple. That is until now. Indeed, remember that John the Baptist was preparing the road for the Lord to come. He was the forerunner for God himself. Thus, from John's heralding, Mark has not put Jesus in Jerusalem until here. This means for the first time since the destruction of Jerusalem, God's glory is returning, and he's doing so in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus makes his approach to the city here not as a mere man, but as the incarnate God. After 600 years, God returns to his city. Jesus comes to Jerusalem by the Mount of Olives. This is momentous. And so, to fit the grand occasion, Jesus planned it out just so. He catered every last detail. And for the setup, he employs two disciples who aren't named for us. Yet he sends the two into the village in front of them, either Bethany or Bethphage. And once they enter the village, they find a colt tied up, which they're to bring to him. Yet this tied-up colt is roped to several Old Testament texts. To begin with, the bound donkey colt is a reference to Genesis 49 and the royal promise made to Judah. He bound his colt to a choice vine. This colt marks Jesus as the line of the tribe of Judah, the son of David, just as Bartimaeus recently announced. Next, this Genesis passage is picked up by Zechariah in chapter 9. There he calls Jerusalem to rejoice, for her king is coming to her, righteous and humble, and riding on a donkey, the colt of a jenny. The promise made in Genesis 49 that is refined and clarified in Zechariah 9, Jesus picks up and acts out to fulfill them both. Indeed, Solomon rode David's donkey as he entered Jerusalem to be coronated and enthroned. Well, one greater than Solomon has come. Yet there's something else about this donkey that sets it apart. No one has ever sat on it before. This fires on two levels. First, in the Old Testament, when an animal had been unused for common labor, it was still considered sort of holy before it had been yoked or pulled a wagon or broken to ride, it was special and able to be set apart for holy work. This young donkey, then, is fit and ready for the holy task of carrying the God incarnate, Jesus Christ. Second, to never have been sat on means the colt is unbroken. It's domesticated but not trained. The colt is still part wild, and normally what happens if you try to sit on an unbroken donkey? Well, it kicks and bucks. The donkey will toss you up like a baseball and knock you out of the park with its hooves. So the colt, to let Jesus ride it and it not throw a tantrum, signals that it knows its divine master. 
In this regard, animals are smarter than us humans. We deny our Creator and rebel against Him. Animals, though, always sense their Maker and happily serve His will. The cult submission to Christ testifies to His heavenly origin and divine nature. But there's one more detail about our Lord's planned arrival. He informs the two disciples that someone will ask what they're up to. For strangers to walk into a town and to walk off with a colt looks very much like robbery. What are you doing? This is not a question for information primarily, but it's an alarm to stop. It's a siren to arrest a robbery in progress. Thus, Jesus arms his disciples with a quip to get away. Literally, he says, the Lord or its Lord or its owner has need of it. Now, this can be heard in two ways. Without spiritual ears, it sounds like the owner needs the colt. The disciples are just retrieving it for its rightful owner. And yet with proper hearing, this is not the human owner, but it is the Lord in all caps. The divine Messiah is requisitioning this cult for his royal and sacred purposes. And the right of requisition belongs to the king alone. Thus the Lord will re employ the cult and he will return it promptly. Jesus is not a friend or neighbor who borrows something and never returns it. Well, these are our Lord's plans for coming to Jerusalem, and they all revolve around this unbroken donkey colt. Of course, Jesus' plans are not frustrated. We often plan only for them to be foiled, but he or his, his unfold just as he spoke them. The two disciples run ahead, and there it is, tied up in the street, a colt having never been ridden. They untie it, only to be stopped by a citizen's arrest. They mention that the Lord needs to borrow it, and without delay, they return after a successful mission. And Mark relays every last detail fulfilled, not to show that Jesus is a good planner, but to reveal his prophetic word. This is the power of his word to speak just so and for it to come true with precision. Moreover, if he is able to finish his word here, then he's able to fulfill the old prophetic words of Genesis 49 and Zechariah chapter 9 and 14. A prophet is proven true by the fulfillment of his word, and so Jesus is a true prophet. And with the disciples back, the festivities can commence. The disciples spread their cloaks on the colt like a royal saddle, and Jesus sits on the donkey that has never been sat on before. The colt does not go crazy with bucking and kicking. That is, we do not come to a rodeo, but to a royal parade. Indeed, at this point, just about everyone starts to catch on to what's going on. After chanting the Son of David by Bartim Bartimaeus, the crowd recognizes the kingliness of Jesus. People lay out their garments on the road as if to roll out the red carpet for him. Not even the hooves of his mount can be soiled by the dirt. Others join in by cutting leafy branches, waving them and laying them on the road. Now these green fronds were a celebratory element of Jewish pilgrim feast. They were a way to praise God for his lush blessings and bountiful provision. The branches, though, also had a nationalistic force to them. They were sort of an Israelite flag brandished to and fro to hail the kingdom. And sure enough, the happy crowds have their minds set on the kingdom. Hordes of people now gather to Jesus as he rides down the Mount of Olives on his Davidic steed. They walk in front and behind, and in the excitement, someone starts singing. The tune spreads like wildfire, and soon the whole parade turns into a choir. And the song could not be providentially better as they harmonize Psalm 118. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one coming in the name of the Lord. Blessing is the coming kingdom of our father David. 
Now, Psalm 118 is a victory song and an entry song. That is, it calls for the gates of righteousness to be opened to the victorious king as he returns to Jerusalem. It is a psalm of royal procession to praise God for the salvation wrought through the Davidic king. It was created for the very moment of the king entering Jerusalem for the people. And so the crowds have chosen well as they sing Hosanna to parade the messianic king into the city of Zion. However, there is a sharp political note in their song. Note they equally bless Jesus coming in God's name and the kingdom of David. In the current lingo of the day, to mention the kingdom of David was a geopolitical statement. David's kingdom was to replace that of Rome. The boot of David would kick out Caesar and would install a golden theocracy just as in the days of Solomon. The people then rightly outlined Jesus as the Davidic Messiah, but they wrongly color him in with the colors of politics and the hues of worldly pomp. They get so close, and yet they're still so far off. And this discrepancy is evident by the very imagery Jesus uses for his entry. Now, it's clear that our Lord has prepared his coming to Jerusalem as a royal procession or a parade. And these were quite common in the ancient world, both in the Old Testament and in the Roman world. This was when a king, a victorious general, or some VIP visited a city. It could be their home capital after a battle or just visiting a new city. Either way, these welcome parades shared a same basic pattern and tone. That is, the nobles of the city and the local priest, all the who's who's of the town, would come out and meet the, the king outside the city. The streets would be lined with boys and girls and perfumed with songs and confetti. Then they would bring the king into the city up to the temple for a sacrifice and a large feast. In this way, the city authorities paid homage to the king, and the king laid claim to the city as part of his domain. Additionally, especially for Rome, the Roman emperor or conqueror would ride a majestic war steed or stand in a blinged-out chariot. Dressed in royal robes, the emperor's face was sometimes painted red like the statue of Jupiter, and he was adorned with ivory emblems of authority. The Roman would be drenched in pomp and circumstance, images of power. Yet how different is Jesus from the normal standard? He does ride and not walk, which is an honor, but there's no swooning over fancy robes as he still wears the cloak of a rabbi. The crowd is singing him into the city, but there's not even a whiff of any dignitaries here. No priest, scribe, or governor is there to greet him. All the authorities seem to ignore Jesus. They snub his arrival. And then there's his mount. Jesus rides not in a golden chariot. He is not mounted on a muscled steed like a thoroughbred or a Clydesdale. Instead, he sits on a young donkey. He rides not shadow facts, but Eeyore. Sure, in the Old Testament, kings rode donkeys. They could even be used in battle. But compared to an imperial stallion of Rome, a donkey is a lowly beast of burden. Donkeys carry potatoes and wheat, not kings. But here is the Lord the glory of God returning to Jerusalem for the first time since the exodus or from the exile, and he rides Eeyore. This is a vastly different kind of king. And then there's the grand finale to these royal parades. The king would enter the temple, sacrifice and feast, and be officially recognized as Lord of the city. Well, Jesus, too, goes directly to the temple. The priests do not welcome him. 
He does not sacrifice, and there is no festive table. Instead, he just looks around at everything and leaves. Talk about anticlimactic. We expected fireworks, and we don't even get a candle. Instead of happy music, we hear a foreboding rumble. For Jesus to look around is for him to inspect. This is an assessment, a putting in the balances, a pop quiz. The eyes of Jesus examine everything in order to render a judgment. Now, he will not publish the results of his test until the next day in the upcoming verses. But he hints at the final grade, for he quickly exits. To depart so soon is a repudiation, a failing grade, a rejection. This is Jesus finding the temple and the people bankrupt, and it's him refusing to accept their political concept of his kingship. Jesus is not the political freedom fighter that they want, and he will not allow the, cl- the crowds to define his messiahship. Thus, he repudiates the temple by leaving, and he returns to Bethany with only the 12 disciples. Jesus, Jesus escapes the crowds and the public spaces to be with the 12 apostles, the foundation of his church. He removes himself from all social media to be alone with his disciples. Moreover, it seems like Mark is playing off the name of Bethany. Now, this isn't certain, but Jesus repudiates the temple to stay in Bethany, the house of affliction and humility. He leaves the house of gold to remain in the house of humble affliction. Truly, Jesus is not a ruler like the rulers of this age. He comes not to lord his authority over, but he came to serve and to suffer as a ransom for sinners. And so is your king and your kingdom to which you belong. As seen here, Jesus is your king. He is the very glory of God himself come in human flesh. This entry is God coming to Jerusalem for the first time since Ezekiel 11. Likewise, Jesus is the victorious Davidic Messiah, the the praise of Psalm 118 rightfully belongs to him. And yet all the glory of Christ comes on a donkey. He comes not to feast on a sacrifice, but to become the sacrifice for your sins. This is how Christ demonstrated his power and authority by letting it go to die for you. He was victorious for your salvation, not by wielding a sword, but by shedding his blood for your sins. Moreover, the kingdom he makes us a part of is not concerned with the shining pomp of this world. No, Jesus retires and lives with us in the house of humble affliction. We follow him by humble service and enduring many tribulations. Beloved, this is your king and kingdom. Let us then joyfully embrace him by faith. May we happily love him with humble service and faithful endurance. And may we be those who ever join the angels in heaven to sing, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be Christ and his kingdom forever. For this is our chief end now and for eternity. Thus let us sing to our Savior for all he has done for us. Amen. Let us pray. Glorious Father, we thank you for the way Christ in such simple and yet profound imagery fulfills these elaborate and glorious promises of the Old Testament, a promise made way back in Genesis 49, picked up by Zechariah. Jesus also picks up and fulfills them both. Your glory departing in Ezekiel 11 and returning in Zechariah 14, Jesus picks those up 
and returns as the glory of God returning to Israel. And rightfully, this, the crowd sang Psalm 118 to sing of him, Jesus Christ, coming in the name of God. Lord, we thank you for how much this teaches us about our Savior. For, Lord, we love you, but we know our love is often weak and frail and not what it should be. And so much of what encourages our love, causes our love to overflow, is to know more about our Savior. And so, Lord, may we get to know our Savior and love him more from these glorious uh, parts of his earthly ministry, especially here, this triumphal entry. Indeed, O oh Lord, we thank you that not only does he show himself to be the glory of God and the Davidic Messiah, but that he shows us that his glory is completely other, that he is glorified not among gold and ivory, not among the public spaces of the world, but he's glorified by laying down his life on a cross for us in a small corner of the Roman Empire. Indeed, on Golgotha, he was glorified as he died for us so that he might win us and redeem us to be his people. Thus, O Lord, we thank you that you've redeemed us at a price, the price of Jesus Christ, only life and blood. Thus, we belong to you, body and soul, and this life and the next. And we pray, O Lord, that you would help us to live for your honor. We do cast all our concerns and prayers upon you this morning hour. We thank you, O Lord, that you've given us this perfect intercession through Jesus Christ, and we can come in his name and pray and, and, and cast all our concerns and worries and petitions before you. And so we pray you'd help us as a local church. Indeed, help us, O Lord, for as we live throughout the week, we have many concerns and anxieties. Indeed, all the evils and and tragedies of the world press in upon us. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom to understand and to learn how to respond carefully to all the things that are going on in the world. May we not fear like those who do not have hope. May we not tremble as those outside of Christ. But give us wisdom and thoughtfulness, care and compassion. May we be those who are quick to listen and very slow to speak. For so much of what goes on in the world is troubling. It confuses us. We have many questions and few answers. But we know that you are Lord of it all. We do not see necessarily your plan from all that we look at in the world, but we know you are in control and you do all things well. We pray, O oh Lord, for the particular needs of the saints. We pray that you'd be with us in our marriages as grandparents, as children, Wherever we are, whether we're single or married, in our position and families, may we glorify you. May we glorify you in our jobs, our vocations, in the home and outside the home. Particularly, O Lord, we lift up the particular needs among us. We thank you that this has been a season of rejoicing as we delight to see what you accomplish through our youth and others who are graduating. We thank you that we have... That Lucas graduated from college, we rejoice in him and ask your blessing upon him. We thank you for those who are graduating seminary and soon some to graduate high school. We lift up those who are soon be leaving our midst. We think of Alex and Brennan. We thank you for their time and we pray you would bless them as they journey on and we pray that you would make them fruitful in your kingdom in the place you put them. We thank you for for uh, Jack and Maria, we rejoice in them, and we thank you that you had, uh, that you've brought them to us, and we got to know them, and they were a blessing to us, and we pray that we were a blessing to them, and that as they move up north and get situated, you will continue to watch over them and help them to be fruitful. We think of Maria and her pregnancy and our other expected mothers. We pray that their pregnancies would go well and healthy and give them ho healthy covenant children in that time. We thank you for the braziers. We thank you that they were able to stick around and serve us in this next year and a half. And so we pray your blessings upon them and we rejoice in how much they mean to us and we delight in them. And we pray, O oh Lord, that they would continue to serve and minister here. We thank you for the Baas. We rejoice in their 20 plus years of service to this church and all that they've done. 
We rejoice that in this next stage of life, you are taking them to another place and another field where they will be fruitful. We pray your blessings upon them. May they know how much we love them and are thankful for them. We pray you give them uh, traveling mercies and get them settled in their new area. And now, Lord, we thank you that this reminds us that we are pilgrims that though we will live forever and we will live together forever as saints in Christ, in this life we often meet and greet and move on. And so, Lord, as people come to our church and move on to other places, help us to keep them in our prayers. Help us to remind that even though this pain of saying goodbye is part of this pilgrim life, help us to be comforted by the resurrection. Lord, we pray you bring new visitors and new members We always rejoice to see new people added, and we pray your blessing upon them. We pray, O Lord, that you would continue to grow our church, but may we not think just of our own own local congregation, but help us to be mindful of your church abroad. We thank you that we are one small cell in the great body of Christ, but you have given us expression of this unity through our own denomination. We pray for the OPC as she sends out foreign missionaries and home missionaries, and we pray, O Lord, that you would build and plant churches in our own region and throughout this country, that you would raise up new missionaries, foreign, and to preach the gospel in other uh, languages throughout this world. And may we be partners with them as we pray and give and attend church and support those who are sent out in these wonderful labors of the Great Commission, home missions and foreign missions. Lord, we do pray for common grace Indeed, we pray for competency in those who have, who have power and positions of, of, of authority. Indeed, so often we see the incompetency of those who have offices of authority. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that you would make people competent and to rule well, that you would restrain wickedness, you would preserve life. Indeed, as tragedies happen, we pray for those who are suffering as victims. And we pray, O Lord, that you would somehow shine the light of the gospel even in these tragic moments that we see in this country and other parts of the world. But Lord, we thank you that you always comfort us with the resurrection, that this is our hope, that our life here is is dotted with songs of joy and happy days mixed with days of depression and doubt and darkness and tears. And so, O Lord, as we travel from good day to cloudy days, as as we pass through the valley of the shadow of death and come out on the Lord's day on this Mount Zion and worship and then go back into a valley throughout the week, we pray, O Lord, that we'd keep our eyes upon heaven. Indeed, help us to remember that our sanctification is helping us to prepare to die well in the Lord. May we be those who give our life for you and are eager for that time when we die and is our gain. So may we live for Christ, and we pray the Lord's Prayer, as you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's now stand to recite the Nicene Creed, page 852. What a privilege it is to join our voices to all the saints throughout the ages to confess our one Lord, our one baptism, our one faith. And we do so through the Nicene Creed, page 852. Beloved saints of the Lord, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things invisible and visible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary 
and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds with the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by his prophets. And I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
we come and remember you, you remember us. And you sustain us to your cross. For Lord, we are sustained from here to the end, not just by food and clothes and houses, but we are sustained by the heavenly one. Our hearts and souls need that heavenly version of Christ and God in here. So Lord, may we come today with joyful hearts, singing the Lord to you as we leave him here to proclaim the praise and glory. same manner, after supper, our Lord took the cup, and once again blessed it, and he passed it to all his disciples, and he said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Drink ye all.
dark as Sable's light. For the world is covered with ash as Sable's light left, the light left. Because this is the table of Christ, which is proclaiming death and the Lord to the second time. And so, O Lord, now that you have filled us with the light of Christ, now that the spirit has quieted us as you promised herein, we pray that we would go forth as lights to the world, as children of the day and children of the light, to live for your glory, to rejoice in you as our Heavenly Father, and to image Christ in all that we do and hear. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. also stand to sing 325, hymn 325. Amen. You may be seated. Let's now continue to worship our Lord through the giving of our gifts. Now stand to sing in closing inside cover of the Trinity Psalter hymnal. Now blessed be the Lord our God. Let us stand and sing.
look up now and receive our Lord's benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.